welcome. My name is Frida Weisel. We are in Brooklyn, New York, and I am going to be your tour guide in the Hasidic Williamsburg neighborhood. I have been a tour guide here for seven years. I am the only tour guide specializing in this neighborhood. You might have heard about the neighborhood in the recent Netflix film on Orthodox. So you might have visited, you might have wanted to learn about this very, very unique community. Well, I'm gonna to try to bring you through it with the perspective of both someone who's been a tour guide for quite a long time, but also I uh, grew up in the Satmar Hasidic community and I lived there for 25 years. I was married to a boy from Williamsburg and I had a child in the community. So my perspective is very much informed both as an insider and also a little bit with a distance of someone who left. So we are right now on the lovely waterfront and beautiful, beautiful spring day. Um, behind me, there's Manhattan. Williamsburg is this fantastic paradox of the north side and the other side of the bridge being called by tour guides in a pop culture reference the hipster side and the south side where we are now is where the Hasidic side is and this is sort of where the line demarcation is where we have a mix of Hasidim coming to the park as well as the hipsters. Right behind me that bridge, the Williamsburg Bridge, is the beginning of our story. The Williamsburg Bridge opened in 1903 and it connects the Lower East Side in Manhattan to Williamsburg. 1903 there was a huge influx of immigration. It was a time of overcrowded tenement conditions in the Lower East Side. And what happens when you have overcrowded conditions and a new bridge, people naturally come crossing over. In fact, the Williamsburg Bridge was so much the avenue for immigrant Jews to come into Brooklyn that it was dubbed the Jewish Highway. So we had all of these immigrants who came through the bridge into Williamsburg and started to colonize it. Jews weren't the only ones, there were Eastern European immigrants, but there were also Irish, Italian. There was, this was a very immigrant neighborhood. The community we are visiting, Williamsburg today, has very much changed and it's mostly importantly been changed by the influx of post-Holocaust refugees from the Hungarian region, the Jews who were looking to restart life, this is when my grandparents came. In fact, my father's family settled first in the Lower East Side and then came to Williamsburg as Holocaust survivors. And this is when Williamsburg began to transform from a pre-Holocaust Jewish immigrant neighborhood to today's Hasidic population. The Hasidic movement began in Ukraine in the 18th century with the Baal Shem Tov. And what was revolutionary about the Hasidic movement was that it put a rabbi or a tzaddik at the center of a worship circle. After the Baal Shem Tov's death, this tradition was passed on to his disciples and then it spread all over Eastern Europe from Ukraine to Russia to Poland and Hungary. The Polish Hasidic community was substantial and extremely instrumental to the entire growth of the Hasidic tradition, but unfortunately most of the Hasidic movement uh, was in Poland was destroyed, they perished in the Holocaust. The Hungarian Hasidim had a much higher survival rate because they were only affected by the war. The Nazis only invaded much later towards the end of the war. Um, all four of my grandparents are Holocaust survivors and they lost their families in the war but they were only rounded up in 44 instead of 39 when Poland was invaded. The thing to 
understand about the Hasidic community is that they were already fighting modernity. They were already very concerned about this new westernization that was reaching Eastern Europe before the Holocaust. And they were responding to it even then as a, they saw it as an existential crisis. They saw a need to keep out this new way of dating, this new way of reading, of learning, of educating, because they felt it was a part of a wave of new threats from poverty to pogroms to mass exodus to the United States that were really threatening the Orthodox Jewish way of life, which they saw as synonymous with being Jewish itself. So my grandparents, my great-grandparents were already very stubborn about rejecting assimilation, modernity, before the Holocaust, and they saw the Holocaust as part of that larger story of the threat to the Jewish survival. And after the war, they were determined to continue their fight for their survival. And in order to continue the fight for their survival, they came to the United States because in many countries in Europe, Eastern Europe were suddenly communist. So the United States became a much more hospitable place. The Statue of Liberty, known the world over as a symbol of freedom and promise. Because it was more open to freedom of religion. But they, in New York, they continue to isolate themselves, to resist changing the language, to, re to continue the same fight they had been putting up before the Holocaust. You still speak Yiddish. I grew up speaking Yiddish in the home. You still only go to gender segregated schools and you don't go to college. You still get married in an arranged marriage. And the community is also very careful to keep out secular culture, the culture of individualism, the culture of constant entertainment. So there's no TVs in the homes. Smartphones are officially forbidden. Children are very, very sheltered. So on a day like this, when all the children are out of school because of the quarantine for coronavirus, the streets are filled with children who are on their scooters or on their bicycles because they're not busy on gadgets at home. They don't have the same intentional technological access as the rest of the world because the Hasidic community sees the secular entertainment technology, not technology per se, only entertainment technology, meaning Netflix. It's not so much using the computer to shop, but it's Netflix that the community has been uh, rejecting and they've been doing so very successfully. My perspective is the Holocaust has rejuvenated their fight for making tremendous sacrifices in order to keep their customs alive and you wouldn't have gotten this stubborn perseverance in the face of so much modernity all around them if not for the the suffering the brutal experience that the Hasidim had had in in the war so today the community continues to, on its fourth generation, be very careful about adapting technology but not allowing in the culture that usually comes with it. So you have technology, yes, secular culture, no. The Hasidic population is thriving, it is growing. I estimate it to be now at about 100,000, which is a really large community with a very, very low median age, a lot of children. So we're going to visit some of their neighborhoods and I'll, I'll bring you into the world a little bit. Brooklyn has three bridges connecting uh, Brooklyn to Manhattan. The Williamsburg Bridge uh, is lesser known as the one that is so central to our story of the Hasidic community's relocation into Williamsburg. But behind me over there, we see the other more famous bridges, first the Manhattan Bridge and the much more touristy Brooklyn Bridge, a little obscured from here where we get tourists. It's usually extremely packed um, in the Brooklyn Bridge. You can see the Manhattan skyline. Uh, we also see the Brooklyn Navy Yard 
Um, you can see the salt, I believe that's the salt piles. The Navy Yard used to be extremely active military base. Someone from the community, someone who grew up here uh, in the 40s told me that the color of the neighborhood used to be white because there were so many sailors walking around in their white uniform. very large we only see a portion of it but today it's decommissioned it still services some boats but mostly it doesn't serve its military purposes This is one of the few buildings on Kent Avenue that are very, very pretty um, and new and waterfront and are not Hasidic. Um, I can tell just by the look of it that they are not for the Hasidic community, they're for the hipsters. Uh, I'll take you into the neighborhood and I'll show you what Hasidic homes look like because they are built specifically to accommodate for the holidays, the family life and other religious needs. So this behind me is still the hipster part bleeding in from the north side a little bit at the waterfront area. So right behind me you can see that we're in the Hasidic community already because we have all of these lovely balconies and all these little tiny mini balconies over the windows. This is one of the ways I, when I bike through Brooklyn, know I'm in the Hasidic community because the Architecture in the homes here are designed to accommodate for the specific needs of life in the community. This is South 9th. I really love this block because we see r really the line. On the one hand, we have the staggered balconies, and on the other hand, we have none of the balconies. This is a very hipster building on this side. The reason the Hasidic community builds these staggered balconies is because there's a holiday in the fall called Sukkot or Sikkis when you are obligated to have all of your meals in a hut that's open to the sky. And if your balconies were one on top of the other, or like in the hipster homes, you had no balcony, then you would have a very big problem where at least you wouldn't be able to celebrate the holiday. So one of the ways you know you're in the Hasidic communities, you see these balconies. You come here in, the, in September, you would see even many sukkahs on the sidewalks and they're beautifully decorated. It's a very lively holiday. It's actually my favorite time of year to visit this neighborhood. There's a lot of festivity and it's many of the joy is, if not in the balcony, in the streets. Right behind me we have a, a sukkah inside the balcony and this sukkah now in the middle, well in the beginning of May is a little bit like seeing a Christmas tree in someone's living room in May. It's not appropriate for the time of year but it does give you a look for how the hut looks on the outside during the holiday in September. It's usually beautifully decorated on the inside. So unlike the Christmas tree, which is gonna be glitzy on the exterior and that Christmas decorations are in the exterior, the sukkah de decorations are concentrated on the inside of the hut and the outside could look quite shabby. Right behind me we have the Vision It Sex Synagogue and Boys School up to age 13. This site actually used to be a police station until it was bought by the Vision It Sect. So there are various sects in Williamsburg. There, is, there are no really important differences between the sects in Williamsburg. The largest is Southmar, the one I come from.
but Visionist is also quite large and this is their synagogue. There are several others that are also really substantial. I would, I would venture to guess that about 60% of the population here belongs to the Satmar Institution and the rest are dispersed between different sects, different leaderships. They're like a membership to a different gym, but the same idea. This behind me is the Southmore Girls School building. It is a huge, beautiful, well, character intensive uh, behemoth. It used to be the Eastern District High School. There are some very famous alum, alumni, alumnuses, <laughs> I don't know, from when it was a public school. It was bought off by the Sotomayor sect in I believe the 1980s while the Eastern District was in decline and it has become their school. There are now even from the Sotomayor school, uh, Deborah Feldman who wrote Unorthodox the book, she graduated from the school and it's interesting that she mentions several aspects about the school. For instance that there were gargoyles and the, the rabbis removed it but because they saw it as two like idols so the building has been somewhat modified and there's a lot of interesting story to it the ascetic education for girls and boys is completely gender segregated it's always in separate buildings and it's always different the boys focus on studying the torah they learn as a first language yiddish and as a second language biblical hebrew while the girls learn as a first language yiddish they don't focus as much on religious subjects and they study as a second language. Mm -hmm. They learn English and they learn much more secular subjects like math, science, history. So the girls' school and the boys' schools are completely separate. All the education curriculums in the community here involve busing. So the kids are bused from door to door, from their homes to the boys' school or the girls' school. We are now on Lee Avenue. Lee Avenue is the main street here. It's where all the shops are. It is extremely lively. All the shops here are locally owned mom and pop shops and they are all specifically designed to serve the community's needs of kosher clothing, kosher food, modest clothing, kosher food, kosher toys, kosher technology, and so on. So it's a bustling economy specifically for this community. This is TAG, one of many institutions that cropped up over the years that provide kosher technology. You'll see it's called Technology Awareness Group. They provide internet with filters that ensure you don't see anything that's considered prohibited. They provide smartphones that have been modified as well as tablets. So this is a part of a booming industry within the community of taking technology from the outside modifying it and then adapting it to the community's needs without what's perceived as the threats inherent in these technologies. This is the only kosher phone store as far as I know anywhere in the world. It is one of my favorite places in all of Williamsburg. Personally, I have a kosher phone. My son also has a kosher phone. Really, I think, been a, interesting to see the ingenuity of the community in responding to technology. In the beginning, to get a kosher phone, you had to go to people's houses, but this shop now sells modified flip phones or even smartphones for people's use so they can get the technology, especially as the technology changes, the community is consistently updating to allow for the modified version. This is the newsstand with uh, many Yiddish language uh, newspapers, magazines, reading material. This, for instance, is the Yiddish newspaper, the weekly Der Yid. And this is about the coronavirus story and it's saying that there's been heartache in the community because people have been violating um, the coronavirus social distancing. So this is a plea to people to comply. Um, but he, this is how people read their news formally. Um, and the community has a wide, robust printing industry for kosher censored entertainment.
Oh, see, this is the costume version of the men's clothing. This is the costume version of the strimal, which is the fur hat. Um, and the men's suit and the little kids dress up as little dads every Friday and they celebrate Shabbos in school. They do a little Shabbos party. I, one of the things that I find really interesting and, and, and really lovely here is that the children from a very young age have a very a very accessible concept of what they want to do and be when they grow up. They're not dressing up as superheroes, they're not introduced to this individualism, but rather everyone is going to be a tata, a dad, and there's that aspiration for something accessible that you're very likely to experience, and from when they're really young, they're, the children will be celebrating that by, by dressing up in the costume. <laughs> Children's clothing is, well, it's adorable. I love that. People are very, very into dressing up. And you'll, one of the things a lot of people are, are very, very intrigued by is that the clothing is usually the same for all siblings in the same family. And that's a fashion, a, a trendy thing in here to dress the children very nicely and all of them to wear the same thing. We are at Gottlieb's Deli. It's like the Katz's Deli of Williamsburg. It is my favorite place. I bring all of my groups here. I usually finish my tour and we sit together around the table and we have some of the delicious food. I'll show you some of what they sell. We always have some kugel. Uh, these are different flavors of kugel. Kugel is a staple of the diet. The most popular one is the potato flavor, which I would make many times myself. We have the famous knish. Many of the foods here are Hungarian, very Eastern European inspired. There's a lot of potato. There is a lot of the weekend food. Sold here. This is krotlakshin, which is sauteed cabbage and pasta. Delicious. Lakshin with brazil, which my mother made all the time, is sautéed breadcrumbs with pasta, which is also really good, which we also have when we taste on my tour. This is a personal favorite I buy when I come here. It's called lecho, it's tomatoes and squash. You eat it hot, it's really good. We would eat it on toasted bagels. Very juicy, really delicious. So if you know of Katz's Deli, there's a huge line. It's very famous from the Meg Ryan orgasm scene. <laughs> there's no orgasm scene in this very kosher area, but it's this is like the same fare on a much more local and a much more, I would say, familiar Heimish, sort of authentic, like real neighborhood shop way. This is, from what I have been able to gather, the only restaurant in this neighborhood that offers table service. The rest of the places here have a very eat out or maybe take your food to the table culture. There's not a big dining experience here. Most of the food is home cooked and eaten at home. We're at Flom's Appetizers. There are not many appetizers left in New York altogether, but appetizers used to be the place that you would go even in the early 1900s to buy fish, especially as Jews lived in these tenements where cutting fish would really smell up the place. It wasn't properly ventilated. Appetizers became the place you went to get your fish. Hence the juice locks that you got there would be pickled. You get pickles as well. You get candy at the appetizers. Most of them are gone now. Appetizers are really um, no longer a thing, but in the Hasidic community, this Flom's is onto its sixth generation. It's been through a lot of change. It's selling very different fare now, but it's continuing to adapt to the Hasidic needs. We can say that if not for the Hasidic community, all of these institutions that were brought by the immigrants would have gone the way of the Lower East Side. It wouldn't be here today, but the Hasidim have adapted it to their own life 
lifestyle and continue to keep up many of the old customs from previous earlier immigrants. wire behind me is called an Arab. It is a wire that will be built around areas, serve the purpose of allowing people to use a minimal space where they can carry bags or push strollers on Shabbat. Shabbos in the Jewish community is the day of rest. It starts on Friday at nightfall and goes all the way until Saturday at sundown. It's the day that everything in the community comes to a slower pace. The children, the women, everyone is dressed in their finest. On Shabbos, you see those big furry hats in the street. They're called strimals that the men wear. There are many rules around how to observe the Shabbos. One of them being you're not allowed to carry outside of the air of this little enclosure. We're in Chocolicious, one of the Hasidic candy stores. Um, you'll notice that there are a lot, a lot of baby celebrations, festivities for cycle of life events like Mazel Tov balloons, um, congratulations. We don't have anything that is PG-13 rated in any of the candy. None of the secular culture and like Elsa candy or, or Trump in any of the candy. There's a lot of celebration of life cycle events. The candy here, what I really love about the candy store is it really reflects the priorities of this community. Um, the emphasis on celebrating the Shabbos, on celebrating the holidays, and on celebrating the birth of babies and marriages um, and visiting relatives. And there is like no trace of pop culture, no trace of Christmas here or of Halloween or of um, of Valentine's Day. Everything here is specifically for the community. We have, for instance, in the candy, we can see a bar mitzvah. It's a girl. Thank you. Chocolates. This says the best teacher. Mazel Tov. Good Shabbos. Even number one bus teacher in Yiddish and in English. I always bring my guests here for a pekala, which is a special bag of candy that you give on life cycle events like the birth of a boy or the celebration of a three-year-old's first haircut when he gets the side curls. So the pekala is often very symbolic of these exciting moments in life when routine gets interrupted by something really happy. So I like to treat my tourists so they get a little bit of a taste for that. Folks are also extremely curious about the halva. It's an Israeli Middle, Middle Eastern food. It's made of crushed sesame seeds and sugar. It's very sweet, very, very sweet, um, but also really good. I'm actually gonna buy some right now. One of the things I love to do in my tours is to look at the posters because I try to focus away from the people and on the buildings, the posters, the shops, so that we can learn about the community without as, as little as possible, making people feel uncomfortable, objectifying people. So these posters will often be ads. We have um, an ad over here right now about the heroes in the crisis to celebrate those um, on, the, on the first response line. But we also have something like this in Yiddish, which is very characteristic of the community. It would be something the community will brag about whenever it's criticized. It says, great news, 
Are you not able to leave your home? Don't worry. We help to bring important things free of payment for, for Jews who are locked in the home. So this kind of volunteer service is a big point of pride for the community and it's, it's a part of the package of a very intertwined, emotionally connected world. This is the B110, the bus that is the only bus like it in all of New York City. It uses New York City MTA bus stops but has its own service and its service goes only between one Hasidic neighborhood and another. It goes between Williamsburg and Bar Park where I also give tours. So it's a shuttle between the two worlds. And this bus often gets into trouble because the people on the bus self-segregate. The women sit in the back and the men in the front. And sometimes there have been civil actions because of discrimination, which always made things complicated for the community, which no matter how many civil suits there have been, people continue to self-segregate by gender. Yeah, hold on. Hold on, hold on. Right behind me is one of many beautiful old churches that are still in this neighborhood. There are several still operational Latino churches in the middle of the Hasidic community, even though the Hispanic population has been almost entirely gentrified out of this part of Brooklyn. In the middle of the century, the Hispanic communities were drawn to Williamsburg because of jobs. See, the waterfront was at the time a port. And there were a lot of factories. It was grimy and there were all of these jobs that were entry level for immigrants. And it created around this neighborhood a large immigrant community. The factories closed during the second half of the century because it was no longer profitable to keep them operational in the States. They went outside of the country and the neighborhood Williamsburg went from the 1960s to the 1990s of tremendous decline. This used to be one of our boys. They used to call him Indio the Kid. He got into a fight, into a fist fight with some dude. So when he was ready to fight him, the guy pulled out a gun. So when he turned around to run, that's when he shot him in the back. That's when he dropped over here, he shot him in the head. Losura is a tough. If you can survive Losura, you can survive anything. And eventually Williamsburg was rezoned from residential to commercial and a lot of wealthier people began moving into this area, drove up the prices and pushed out the Hispanic community. is the best and I'm not moving for nobody <laughs> I stand here the Hispanic community used to call this Williamsburg neighborhood Las Suras the south side I don't care about anybody but anybody else I like and the only real remnant of that lively time of Lesuras are the churches This has been a small slice, a small piece of Hasidic Williamsburg that I got to show you. I wish I could show you so much more. Maybe another time I can show you inside the homes, a little bit about the schools, a little bit about the toy stores. I absolutely am fascinated with Hasidic toys. Together, what really draws me to this community is there is a sense that 
Life is much slower and life is not as ambitious as it is in the outside world, the world that I adopted, which I find to have its own merits. But I'm always drawn back here for so much of this family-oriented, prioritizing the community over the individual. And I think it's worth seeing it with an open mind and, and appreciating what drives this community to continue to thrive in the middle of New York City, in the middle of Brooklyn, cheek by jowl with the hipster, trendy 21st century part of New York. Uh, which is originally a Hebrew word but has been corrupted in Yiddish for Yashir Koyach Shkoyach, thank you. So, Shkoyach for watching.